Hi, I'm Tim Tyler, and this is a video which responds to some of Paul Ehrlich's criticisms of memetics, which he gave in an interview with Carl Zimmer. In my book on memetics, which is out now, I take a look at some of the critics and criticisms of memetics. A number of technical criticisms of memetics have been raised, but these appear to be rather uniformly misguided or uninformed. And here we'll look at some of Paul Ehrlich's critical comments about memetics. Paul Ehrlich here is being interviewed by Carl Zimmer, who had a nice section on memes in his Evolution book. Paul Ehrlich knows some things about cultural evolution and has written some nice papers on the topic, including a couple of interesting ones with Marcus Feldman. Here's Carl on the left and Paul on the right. One thing I, I found interesting uh, in, in your book was uh, in talking about cultural evolution, you, uh, you talked a bit about what probably most people who are familiar at all with cultural evolution these days might know about, which is uh, things that are called memes, which Richard Dawkins first introduced, I guess, about 30 years ago now. And you don't see memes as a very good, uh, very promising way to understand uh, how culture evolves. Maybe you could explain why and what might be a better way of, of looking at it. Well, I, I, I think it was a good idea to begin with. You've got to understand that good ideas in science are ones that lead people to look at various issues and try and find better ways of doing things that I think Dawkins should get a lot of credit for coming up with the idea of memes. It was sort of a parallel to a gene. We mm -hmm. pass our genes from generation to generation. Certain kinds of ideas may sort of colonize your mind and be put on and so on and so forth. The problem is that in 30 years, it really hasn't led anywhere, and there are a lot of reasons for that. Maybe the easiest way to see it uh, is the, uh, the famous children's game. I think it's called Telephone, where you get 15 kids in a circle, and right. you whisper to the first one, the card is the ace of spades, and when you get around it, and it's whispered around the circle, and the last person says the message is uh, Jane Fonda is a great movie actress. And mm -hmm. the problem with memes is, unlike genes, genes, for instance, are largely transmitted uh, without modification. You cannot not uh, refuse to accept them. You can't change them purposely, and so on. So it's a really very different dynamic from ideas which can be changed not just by accident, but on purpose. and. Um, and can be modified in all kinds of ways. So it hasn't led to the kind of theory that I would have liked to have seen or that most of my colleagues would have liked to have seen. But it's been an important idea because it's allowed people to, you know, to discuss the issues and say, okay, it's not going this way, then how is it going to go? In other words, you should not, it's in no way uh, a criticism of Dawkins. It was a good idea, it just didn't pan out the way a lot of us hoped it would. Mm. Paul complains that the mutation rate in cultural evolution is high, giving the example of Chinese whispers. The mutation rate in organic evolution is in fact highly variable. Some organisms reduce their mutation rate well below what would help them to evolve adaptively. However, other organisms attempt to live in environments which are too hostile for them, and their genomes get mutated into oblivion and they suffer from a mutational meltdown. Heat, radiation and chemicals can all cause mu the mutation rate to shoot up. If you want to see the equivalent of Chinese whispers in the organic realm, then you can look at creatures at ground zero in Chernobyl and Fukushima. You will see that there is no shortage of mutations there. Similar hostile environments occur naturally and frequently involve intense heat or radiation. Evolutionary theory handles differing mutation rates just fine. The mutation rate is a parameter in most evolutionary theories of inheritance and can be set to whatever value you like. Cultural evolution does high fidelity transmission too. The Bible illustrates reasonably high transmission fidelity is not a new phenomenon, and on the internet engineers can produce more or less whatever error levels they like using error correction technologies, and they easily push the error rates down further than you see in organic evolution. Paul says that you can't refuse to accept genes, whereas you can refuse to accept memes. However, that's not true. You can refuse to accept genes. Contraception use represents a refusal to accept genes. Use of barrier contraceptives by men results in a substantial reduction in the spread of sexually transmitted disease genes. Use of hormonal contraception by women results in a rejection of her partner's genes. If you avoid sharing needles with drug addicts, you can substantially reduce your chance of acquiring the genes of a number of unwanted diseases. Vaccines represent another preemptive rejection of certain genes, and so on. Paul says that genes are largely transmitted without modification, whereas memes can be modified, and that you can't change genes deliberately, whereas you can change memes. Except that now people can change genes deliberately these days. 
Genetic engineering is still a relative newcomer to the scene, but already is used ubiquitously in making the foods that we eat. Engineering isn't really much of a difference between the organic and cultural realms, since we have both genetic engineering and mimetic engineering. Evolutionary theory incorporates mimetic engineering in much the same way that it incorporates genetic engineering, via directed mutations and deliberative selection. Paul says of mimetics that, in 30 years, it really hasn't led anywhere. Now, it seems to me that the 1976 publication by Richard Dawkins on the topic was fairly rapidly followed by a flurry of activity in the field from academics, with publications in the early 1980s from Lumsden and Wilson, Cavalli, Sforter and Feldman, and Boyd and Richardson. That may not be a coincidence, and Richard Dawkins does get cited. Yes, these folks mostly attempted to rebrand memetics in the process of putting their own personal stamp on it, but most of the basic ideas are pretty similar underneath except in the case of Lumsden and Wilson, who were way off base, as is now widely recognised. One thing you have to bear in mind is that, in academia, all types of cultural evolution face the problem that the people whose job it is to study the evolution of human culture, so cultural anthropologists, historians, and so on, mostly can't stomach Darwinism and have a 150-year-old tradition of misguided resistance to evolutionary explanations. This appalling situation stunts all academic forms of cultural evolution, not just its best-known form, memetics. We have had multiple memetics conferences, a memetics journal, a number of books and hundreds of papers on memetics, and on the internet there's been a meme revolution. Internet memes are now covered regularly by news channels, and memetic hitchhiking is used ubiquitously by marketing companies to help distribute their products. Instead of memetics, academ academia has cultural evolution and gene culture coevolution, which are extremely similar to memetics, but typically shun the M-word due to what looks a lot like petty turf wars and not invented here syndrome. Most of the problems with the adoption of memetics are really sociological problems. There's nothing technically wrong with memetics. Paul Ehrlich has made some other criticisms of memetics in print. For instance, in 2005 he was the lead author of a paper which said, Among humans, genes can only pass unidirectionally from one generation to the next, vertically, normally through intimate contact. But ideas, or memes, now regularly pass between individuals distant from each other in space and time within generations and even backwards through the generations. Through mass media or the internet, a single individual can influence millions of others within a very short period of time. In fact, these objections are rather easily identified as being misguided ones. Cold virus genes pass from host parent to host offspring. They pass between individuals of the same generation and are also transmitted backwards through the generations, from offspring to parent. Hepatitis B is a hardy virus that can exist on almost any surface for up to a month, and so can be transmitted by mail. Anthrax is an infectious bacterium that has been weaponized and sent through the mail. There are all kinds of other waterborne infections that can travel large distances using the river system. Salmonella and E. coli bacteria are able to, are able to survive on food inside aeroplanes. Viruses can spread from one person to many in what is commonly known as a pandemic. So, while the relationship between cultural and organic realms looks pretty close in these respects, it seems pretty clear that Paul has been criticising memetics without being very familiar with its basic concepts. The reason experts in the field produce invalid technical criticism, uh, criticisms of memetics is because they are unable to produce correct technical criticisms of it because there is nothing wrong with it. Enjoy!